so our funds are available to individual investors whether you're accredited or non-accredited and we've made that possible through i'd say both technology and regulatory innovation and and our check size is ten dollars so you can get onto the platform and into our funds with a minimum of a, a, a $10 investment, which is very, very low, of course. For our FinTech Spotlight segment this month, we are featuring our affiliate partner, Fundrise, a platform that gives people a better way to invest in real estate. I've invited the CFO of Fundrise, Allison Stallo, on the show today to discuss why real estate should be a consideration for our overall portfolios. Welcome to the show, Allison. Thanks for having me, Andy. Thrilled to be here. Absolutely. This is great. I have uh, dabbled with Fundrise myself, so I'm excited to chat with you and learn more about real estate in general from your perspective. Let's talk about why it's important for people to consider real estate as part of their overall portfolio. Yes, I think the, the two things that stick out to me the most are diversification and uncorrelated returns. So you know, from a diversification standpoint, every good investment portfolio, of course, should be balanced and, and real estate and, you know, alternative assets more broadly, I think are, are critical to having a balanced portfolio. And, and then the, on the second point, the uncorrelated returns, as you probably know, private market investments have made positive net investment returns over most of the prior decade plus to institutional portfolios, but you know, retail and individual investors haven't historically had access, but I think want and need returns uncorrelated to, to traditional markets. I think the research is pretty clear that portfolios that are overly reliant on traditional markets deliver lower returns and have higher volatility than portfolios that include alternatives like real estate or, um, you know, something in private equity, like growth equity. Got it. Well, can you talk about the, the importance of a lower volatility investment as we maybe get closer to wanting some income streams in our lives or things that are outside of just general growth stocks as we try to build up our retirement portfolios? Yeah. So, I mean, l lower volatility will, will benefit your portfolio because you, you won't see the, the, you know, really, um, extreme ups and downs over time. So you, You'll you'll see you know more um, resilient growth through you know all kinds of different economic environments. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Now now there are some aspects where stocks maybe beat out real estate when it comes to certain things. Can you talk about some of those just for some transparency on both sides? Sure. Yeah. Um, so I think you know liquidity is is the first one. Of course, you can get even daily liquidity um, in in the stock market. Um, of course, there's advantages to that. Um, obviously, having access to your capital when and if you need it is important. I'll say there is a premium that you pay for that liquidity, um, kind of a built-in cost and neat to public market investments. And, and if you're a buy and hold or a long-term investor, that can be an expensive feature if you aren't using it. Um, I think another um, major benefit to the stock market is that it's so easily accessible. Um, you can get access to almost any stock at almost any time. Um, and then maybe another feature to, to your point about volatility, there is more volatility in the stock market. And while, um, you know, I, I think balancing that and having both in your portfolio is important if you're a mean stock trader. <laughs> you know, there's there's the short term ability to to game the system, and and obviously we wouldn't recommend that. But I think some people are are interested in that aspect of the public markets. Got it. Okay. Well, we're nodding our heads and saying, yeah, we need a little real estate in our portfolio to diversify things. But you know, for somebody like me, I'm a busy dad. I got a lot of stuff going on. I can't really see myself landlording or dealing with a lot of other right. people in this process, you know, talk to us about how Fundrise steps in to make the process a little easier for people who want to invest in real estate, but maybe don't want to get their hands as dirty as some people who do it successfully as a business. Yeah. So, I mean, to, to your first point, the personal management um, is, is often um, you know, barrier to entry for people getting into real estate. You have to actually manage the property. You have to secure financing. You have to make property management decisions and and fix any problems that that come up. I think access has um, historically been an issue. Institutional investors have have been able to access real estate or other alt asset classes. Um, retail hasn't always been able to get into it or get access to the best investments um, or even the biggest investments, and that might be in part. Um, because of another challenge, which is the investment size. So typically larger checks are needed for real estate. Um, there's the cost of a down payment. Um, and then the amount needed to invest in multiple properties can restrict you from getting appropriate diversification. Um, you can't diversify sufficiently when you know, you're doing it on your own, or even when you're investing directly in projects, it takes time to transact. And so how do you continue to find sufficient deal flow? to maintain appropriate diversification across multiple properties. And so how, how Fundrise um, 
solves those issues is, is number one through the access issue. So our funds are available to individual investors, whether you're accredited or non-accredited. And we've made that possible through, I'd say, both technology and regulatory innovation. And, and our check size is $10. So you can get onto the platform and into our funds with a minimum of a, a, a $10 investment, which is very, very low, of course. I think, you know, we've also focused on incentive alignment and kind of disrupting that in the real estate space, specifically our fees are low and non-performance based. So we aren't taking a disproportionate share of your upside and therefore we aren't kind of incentivized to make these really risky bets that, that you might see in, in other private market vehicles. I think next uh, diversification, you know, all, all of our investment products, all of our offerings are in diversified vehicles with exposure to tens or even hundreds of investments in one portfolio. Um, we manage the portfolios and the leverage for you through those vehicles. So you're not having to, to take care of and, and manage um, individual properties. And then we do that also, you know, creating a strategy. We have multiple strategies, income balance and growth, but our broad strategy is focused on the macro. So we focus on long-term macro drivers of the U.S. real estate market. Um, specifically, I'd say looking at the increased demand for well-located residential assets across the Sunbelt. We're buying directly from home builders and leasing up ourselves um, as stabilized communities. Um, which, you know, I, I think helps our returns. This is kind of focused on the idea that people are looking for, um, you know, not a one bedroom by the metro, but a three bedroom by the mountains in, in today's environment. And then also the explosion of e-commerce has driven, um, you know, it, a need for industrial spaces and last mile distribution near highly populated cities. Um, and, and we're focused on, on that um, aspect of real estate as well. Got it. So the shift that's happened over the past couple of years where people are leaving the long-term corporate commercial real estate lease is something that you guys are well aware of and already well ahead of diversifying. Is that right? Yeah, it's, it's actually been our strategy over you know, the last five to 10 years um, focused on some of these shifts, these paradigm shifts that, that you've seen post-pandemic. Um, but but also explosion of AI and um, remote work, all, all of these things um, are, are kind of driving, we think, um, value into this single family residential build to rent category and and then industrial as well. Got it. Yeah, they're, they're, I've heard the talk over the past whatever 10 years, you know, you look for those markets that are favorable for uh, investors, favorable for landlords, but then, you, you know, you fly down there and then you look at the markets and then you got to try to find the person, then you got to find the, the landlord company or the, a property management company that'll help you manage things locally. And then you got to find your network of people to help you make sure that the thing that broke doesn't get broke. It sounds like you guys are kind of cutting out all that action. Is that right? Yeah, effectively. So individuals don't have to do it. We we manage that for you. We manage external property managers and, and then we do a lot of the asset management ourselves. So, you know, cutting out the need for you to be involved in that in any way, even in an oversight. And the education piece as well, because this is intimidating to a lot of people, including me. I, I, I don't know where to go to invest these things or where to go. I mean, talk about the research side on your side or the education piece that helps people feel confident knowing that they're are investing in uh, good areas and, and areas for growth and and for for income and dividends down the road. Yeah, so I think our, our user experience is definitely a differentiator. Um, if if you go onto our app or our website, you can find you know number one tons of um, educational articles about how we think about um, the the real estate strategy as a strategy, as well as um, you know different aspects of um, you know different types of strategies within the, the broader real estate industry. You can also find a kind of a wealth of information about the product, the projects um, that we've invested in in our app, and I think that's. Um, again, a differentiator from from you know maybe a, a traditional real estate manager that you you might um, get access to through like a you know one of the the large traditional asset managers in a REIT. Um, they're they're going to be investing through layers of other REITs, and you're not necessarily going to get information on a project by project basis, um, which I, I think is unique to to fintech broadly, um, but definitely to to our app. Um, you can go in there. You can look at you know all of the all of the data on on each of the projects that are in your portfolio. Got it. Well, you you brought up REITs. Let's talk about that a little bit because what they do have on, or at least publicly traded, you know the the vanguards or the the fidelities. You you could have that liquidity event a lot quicker if you wanted to. Now with Fundrise, you guys are saying up up front 
this is a long-term thing. You know, you want to jump in this, this is five years, 10 years plus. Talk, talk about that a little bit. Yeah. We, I mean, as a strategy, you, you should want to be invested in real estate for the, the long term. You're, you know, you're not realizing we're not buying and selling real estate assets on a, on a daily basis, of course. And so we think you're going to see the best returns if, if you're in it for the long term. That said, our real estate portfolios all have a quarterly liquidity um, feature. And so you can, you can redeem on a quarterly basis. That makes a lot of sense. So as, uh, as people are looking towards the future, you know, I saw an article recently that, um, that this return to the office or work from home thing is maybe going to be gone by the end of 2024. How, how does that play into your plans for commercial real estate in the future? Or does that affect you guys at all? So we're, we're not, we don't have a strategy in office we're retail. Um, so there's, there's very little, if any of that in our portfolios. Um, but I, I think to your broader point, just, you know, what's happening in, in the market, in the economy, how are we planning for, for that growth? I think, you know, we would say recessions take a long time to form. There's a, a big lag from cause to effect. And we aren't yet seeing the full effects of rising interest rates. And so we think things will get worse before they get better. I think assets of all kinds um, will continue to experience markdowns, although not uniformly. And, you know, we and investors have to kind of survive that period that, that we think will be temporary, where asset values are broadly depressed and borrowing costs are significantly higher compared to kind of the near zero rate interest environment of the last decade. And so in the midst of that, we continue to protect the downside while optimizing for opportunity. And so we do that by we continue to position our portfolio to withstand this new norm of inflation and rising interest rates. Our strategy, again, is focused on industrial and SFR, um, single family residential build to rent um, within the Sun Belt, um, both of which we think will be resilient in an inflationary environment. And then we've repositioned defensively over the last 12 to 18 months, so lowering effective overall leverage within our portfolio and then building up greater cash reserves. And, and we think new opportunities will emerge as otherwise attractive asset kind of deep intrinsic value um, and strong growth potential will basically go on sale. So like late stage growth equity, we've just launched an innovation fund focused on more venture capital type investments um, and then opportunistic credit credit opportunities where investors can capitalize on kind of the, the over leverage and short sightedness of so many in the financial markets over the last decade. And so, you know, resiliency through this economic environment depends on preparation. Um, that includes having investments with stable underlying cash flow streams, sufficient liquidity, and, and again, relatively um, modest leverage. And so, you know, being prepared for the different stages of opportunistic investment opportunities that will kind of present over that evolution through to what we think is a likely recession coming and then eventual rebound uh, is, is what, what, what we're kind of um, looking forwards towards. Got it. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a balance of people who listen to the show. There's people who are maybe saving up for their first home mm -hmm. that uh, are considering that. And then there's people who are, Hey, I will, I would like to invest in single family real estate to be a, an income stream. Do you guys, uh, are you a part of this conversation recently about REITs buying up all this real estate and single family homes? And how do you, how do you guys have those conversations with people who want to maybe on one side, just buy their first home right. with, are you guys having a lot of them for rent? How, do, how does that conversation happen with you guys at Fundrise? Are, are you, are you supporting that uh, uh, conversation? How, how is that going? Yeah. I mean, we're, we're definitely part of that um, narrative because we are such a big buyer in the SFR space. I, I would distinguish what we're buying from what a, everyday um, individual like me or, or you are trying to buy in the markets, you know, we, we aren't buying off MLS. We aren't buying scattered homes. Um, we are wor working directly with builders while they're in the process of building, buying entire neighborhoods that mm. are being built for the purpose of rent. Um, you know, you, you see in you know, in, in this economy, a lot of millennials, Gen Zs are, are not able to buy their first homes when they thought they would for various reasons, inflation, rising interest rates uh, among many, um, but they don't want to live in an apartment anymore and they, they want to live in a house. And so we believe we're, you know, contributing to building up um, the availability of, of rental homes for people to live in until they can buy their first house and not competing 
with everyday investors um, because they aren't going to be buying whole neighborhoods uh, that are that are intended right. for rent. Got it. I, this is a great conversation, Allison. I really appreciate you jumping on. Um, everybody, I, I've had a chance to dive into Fundrise myself uh, as an investor. I think it's uh, an interesting place to put a portion of my my portfolio, as Allison and I talked about. You know, there's no one size fits all that solu- uh, is a solution for everything of all your needs. It's good to look at these different alternative assets uh, and a good way to diversify your portfolio. Now, everybody, if you're interested in learning more about Fundrise, you can go to marriagekidsandmoney.com slash Fundrise. That's marriagekidsandmoney.com slash Fundrise. I am an affiliate with Fundrise. Uh, I'm also an investor with Fundrise. Yeah. So if you check out that affiliate, not only are you going to learn more about Fundrise and get started with investing, but you're also going to support this show. So Allison, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Andy. This is super fun. Super fun.